Let's see if we can give ourselves an intuitive understanding of the mean value theorem. And as we'll see, if you, once you parse some of the mathematical lingo and notation, it's actually a quite intuitive theorem. And so let's just think about some function f. So let's say I have some function f, and we know a few things about this function. We know that it is continuous, continuous over, continuous, continuous over the closed interval between x equals a and x is equal to b. And so when we put these brackets here, that just means closed interval. That means we're including, so when I put a bracket here, that means we're including the point a. And if I put the bracket on the right-hand side instead of a parenthesis, that means that we are including the point b. And continuous just means we don't have any gaps or jumps in the function over this closed interval. Now let's also assume that it's differentiable. It's differentiable differentiable over the open interval between a and b. So now we're saying, well, it's, it's OK if it's not differentiable right at a, or if it's not differentiable right at b. And differentiable just means that there's a defined derivative, that you can actually take the derivative at those points. So it's differentiable over the open interval between a and b. So those are the constraints we're going to put on ourselves for the mean value theorem. And so let's just try to visualize this thing. So this is my function. That's the y-axis. And uh, this right over here is the x-axis. And I'm going to, it's the x-axis. And let me draw my interval. So that's a. And then this is b right over here. And so let's say our function looks something like this. Let's say it looks something, draw an arbitrary function right over here. Let's say my function looks something like that. So this point right over here, the x value is a, and the y value is f of a, f of a. This point right over here, the x value is b, and the y value, of course, is f of b, f of b, f of b. So all the mean value theorem tells us is if we take the average rate of change over the interval, that at some point, the instantaneous rate of change, at least at some point in this open interval, the instantaneous change is going to be the same as the average change. Now what does that mean visually? So let's calculate the average change. The average change between point A and point B, well, that's going to be the slope of the secant line. That's going to be the slope of the secant line. So that's. So this is the secant line, so think about its slope. All the mean value theorem tells us is that at some point in this interval, the, the instant slope of the tangent line is going to be the same as the slope of the secant line. And we can see, just visually, it looks like right over here, the slope of the, slope of the tangent line is, it looks like the same as the slope of the secant line. It also looks like the case right over here, the slope of the tangent line is equal to the slope of the secant line. And it makes intuitive sense. At some point, your instantaneous slope is going to be the same as the average slope. Now how would we write that mathematically? Well, let's, let's, calculate, let's, calculate, well, let's calculate the average slope over this interval. Well, the average slope of the, over this interval, or the average change, the slope of the secant line, is going to be our change in y our change in y right over here, over our change in x. Over our change, our change in x. Well, what is our change in y? Our change in y is f of b minus f of a, minus f of a, and that's going to be over, and that is going to be over our change in x. Over b minus b minus a. Let me do that in that right color. So let's just remind ourselves what's going on here. So this right over here, this is the graph of y is equal to f of x. We're saying that the slope of the secant line, or our average rate of change over the interval from a to b, is our change in is our change in y, our change in y. That the Greek letter delta is just shorthand for change in y over our change in x over our change in x, which of course is equal to this. And the mean value theorem tells us that there exists, so if 
if we know these two things about the function, then there exists, there exists some, some x value in between a and b. So in the open interval between a and b, there exists some c, there exists some c, and we could say it's a member of the open interval between a and b, between a and b, or we could say some c such that a is less than such that a, a is less than c, which is less than b. So some c in this interval. So some c, some c in, in between it, where the instantaneous rate of change at, at that x value is the same as the average rate of change. So there exists some c in this open interval where the average rate of change is equal to the instantaneous rate of change at that point. That's all it's saying. And as we saw in this diagram right over here, this could be our c, or this could be our c as well. So nothing, nothing really, it looks, you know, you would say f is continuous over a, b, differentiable over, uh, over well, f is continuous over the closed interval, differentiable over the open interval, and you see all of this notation, you're like, what is that telling us? All it's saying is, at some point in the interval, the instantaneous rate of change is going to be the same as the average rate of change over the whole interval. And the next video will try to give you a kind of a real life example about when, when that makes sense. Let's say I have some function f of x that is defined as being equal to x squared minus 6x plus 8 for all x. And what I want to do is show that, it, that for this function, we can definitely find a c in an interval where the derivative at the point c is equal to the average rate of change over that interval. So let's, let's give ourselves an interval right over here. Let's say we care about the interval between 2 and 5. And this function is clearly both, it can definitely continuous over this closed interval, and it's also, it's also differentiable over it. And it just has to be differentiable over the open interval, but this is differentiable really for all x. And so let's show, let's show that we can find, find a c that's inside the open interval, that's a member of the open interval, that's in the open interval, such that, such, that the derivative at c is equal to the average rate of change over this interval, or is equal to the slope of the secant line between the two endpoints of the interval. So it's equal to f of 5 minus f of 2 over 5 minus 2. And so I encourage you to, po to pause the video now and try to find a c where this is actually true. Well, to do that, let's just calculate what this has to be. Then let's just take the derivative and set them equal, and then we should be able to solve for our c. So let's see, f of 5 minus f of 2. f of 5 is, let's see, let me, f of 5 is equal to 25 minus 30 plus 8. So that's negative 5 plus 8 is equal to 3. f of 2 is equal to 2 squared minus 12. So it's 4 minus 12 plus 8. That's going to be 0. So this is equal to 3 over 3, which is equal to 1. f prime of c is equal to, needs to be equal to 1. And so what is the derivative of this? Well, let's see. f prime of x is equal to 2x minus 6. And so that's going to be need, we need to figure out at what x value, especially it has to be within this, in this open interval, at what x value is it equal to 1? So this needs to be equal to 1. So let's add 6 to both sides. You get 2x is equal to 7. x is equal to 7 and halves, 7 halves, which is the same thing as 3 and a half. So it's definitely in this interval right over here. So we've just found our c. c is equal to 7 halves. And let's just graph this to really make sure that this makes sense. So let's, let's this right over here is our y-axis. And then this right over here is our x-axis. Looks like all the action is happening in the first and fourth quadrants. So that is our x-axis. And let's see, let's say this is 1, 2, 3, 4, and 5, 
So we already know that 2 is one of the zeros here. So we know that our function, if we wanted to graph it, it intersects the x-axis right over here. And you can factor this out as x minus 2 times x minus 4. So our other, the other place where our function hits 0 is when x is equal to 4 right over here. Our vertex is going to be right in between at x is equal to 3. When x is equal to 3, let's see, 9 minus, 9 minus 18 is negative 9 plus 8, so negative 1. So you have the point 3, negative 1 on it. And so that's enough for us to... To graph it. And we also know at 5 we're at 3. So 1, 2, 3. So at 5 we are right over here. So over the interval that we care about, our graph looks something like this. Our graph looks something like this. So that's the interval that we care about. And we're saying that we were looking for a C whose slope is the same as the slope of the secant line, same as the slope of the line between these two points. And if I were to just visually look at it, I'd say, well, yeah, it looks like right around there, just based on my drawing. The slope of the tangent line looks like it's parallel. It looks like it has the same slope. It looks like the tangent line is parallel to the secant line. And that looks like it's right at 3 and a half or 7 halves. So it makes sense. So this right over here is our C. C is equal to 7 halves. Let's say we have the function f of x is equal to x to the sixth minus 3x to the fifth. And my question to you is, using only what we know about derivatives, try to figure out over what interval or intervals is this function decreasing. Pause the video and try to figure that out. All right, now let's do this together. So we know that a function is decreasing when its derivative is negative. Or another way to say it, it's going to be decreasing when f prime of x is less than 0. So what is f prime of x? Well, we could use the derivative rules and derivative properties we know. We apply the power rule to x to the 6th. We bring the 6 out front, or multiply the 1 coefficient here, times 6 to get 6x to the 5th, decrement that exponent, minus Bring the 5 times the 3, minus 15x to the, we decrement the 5, so x to the 4th. And we need to figure out over what intervals is this going to be less than 0. And now let's see how we can simplify this a little bit. Both of these terms are divisible by x to the 4th, and they're both divisible by 3. So let's factor out a 3x to the 4th times you factor out a 3x to the fourth here, you're left with a 2x. And then over here, you have minus 5 has to be less than 0. Any interval where this is true, we are going to be decreasing. Now, how do we get this to be less than 0? Well, if I take the product of two things and it's less than 0, that means that they have to have different signs. Either one's positive and the other's negative, or one's negative and the other's positive. So we have two situations. So we could say either either 3x to the fourth is greater than 0 and, and 2x minus 5 is less than 0. So that's one situation. I'll do this in a different color. Or, and I'll do this one in a different color, 3x to the fourth is less than 0 and 2x minus 5 is greater than 0. Actually, let me stay on the second case first. Are there any situations where 3x to the fourth can be less than 0? You take any number, you take it to the fourth power, even if it's a negative, it's going to become a positive. So you can't get a negative expression right over here. So actually, the second condition is impossible to obtain. You can't get any situation for any x where 3x to the fourth is less than 0. So we can rule this one out. And so this is our best hope. So under what conditions is 3x to the fourth greater than 0. Well, if you divide both sides by 3, you get x to the fourth is greater than 0. And if you think about it, this is going to be true for any x value that is not equal to 0. Even if you have a negative value there, if you have a negative 1, you take it to the fourth power, it becomes a positive 1. Only 0 will be equal to 0 when you take it to the fourth power. So one way we could say this is going to be true for any non-zero x. Or we could just say x does not equal 0. And this is a little bit more straightforward. We add 5 to both sides. We get 2x is less than 5. 
divide both sides by 2, you get x is less than 5 halves. So it might be tempting to say, all right, the intervals that matter are all the x's less than 5 halves, but x cannot be equal to 0. Now, is that the entire interval where our function is decreasing? Well, let's think about what happens at 0 itself. We're decreasing over the interval from negative infinity all the way up to 0, and we're also decreasing from 0 to 5 halves. And so if we're decreasing right to the left of 0, and we're decreasing right to the right of 0, we're actually going to be decreasing at 0 at, at we're also going to be decreasing at 0 as well. So there's something interesting here. Even though the derivative at x equals 0 is going to be equal to 0, we are still decreasing there. And so the interval that we care about, the interval over which we're decreasing, is just x is less than 5 halves. And we can see that by graphing the function. I graphed it on Desmos. And you can see here that the function is decreasing from negative infinity. It's decreasing at a slower and slower rate. We get to 0. It's still decreasing to the left of 0. And then it continues to decrease to the right of 0. So any, any value, any x value to the left of 0, it's going, the value of the function is going to be larger than f of 0. And x to the right of 0, the value of the function is going to be less than the function at 0. So it's actually decreasing through 0, even though the slope of the tangent line at 0 is 0, even though it's non-negative. And then we keep decreasing. So we're decreasing for all values of x less than 5 halves, which you can see visually here. Let g be a function defined for all real numbers. Also let g prime, the derivative of g, be defined as g prime of x is equal to x squared over x minus 2 to the third power. On which intervals is g increasing? Well, at first you might say, well, they don't even give us g. How do we figure out when g is increasing? Well, the, the answer is, all we need is g prime, which they do give us. And saying on which intervals is g increasing, that's equivalent to saying on which intervals is the first derivative with respect to x, on which intervals is that going to be greater than 0. If your rate of change with respect to x is greater than 0, if it's positive, then your function itself is going to be increasing. And so there's a couple of ways that we could approach this. You might just want to ins inspect kind of the structure of this expression and think about, well, when is that going to be greater than 0? Or we could do it a little bit more methodically. We could say, well, look, let's look at the critical points or the critical values for g. So critical, critical points for g. And just to remind ourselves what critical points are, that is when g prime of x is equal to 0 or g prime of x is undefined, is undefined. And we have videos on critical points or critical values. And why those are relevant is those are the places, those are the possible places where the sign could change, the sign of g prime could change. So when is g prime of x equal to 0? Well, the way to get g prime of x equal to 0 is getting the numerator equal to 0. And that's only going to happen if x squared is equal to 0 or if x is equal to 0. So that's the only place where g prime of x is equal to 0. And where is g prime of x undefined? Well, it's going to be undefined if the denominator becomes undefined. The denominator becomes undefined if the denominator is 0. And so that's going to happen if x minus 2 is equal to 0. x minus 2 is equal to 0, or x is equal to 2. So we have two critical points or critical values here. And what I'm going to do is I'm going to graph them. Let's put them on a number line. And let's just think about what g prime is doing in the intervals between the critical points. So let's start at 0, 1, 2, 3, and then let's go to negative 1. And we have a critical point at, let me do that in magenta. We have a critical point at x equals 0, right over there. And we have a critical point at x equals, at x equals 2, right over there. And so let's think about what g prime is doing in, these, in the intervals between the critical values, or on either side of the critical values. So let's think about, let's first think about this interval. Let me do it in this purple color. Let's think about the interval between, between negative infinity and 0. So if we think about this interval, so negative infinity and 0, that open interval. 
Well, if we look at g prime, the numerator is still going to be positive. You take any negative value, you square it, you're going to get a positive value. So this is going to be positive. Now what about the denominator? You take a negative number, you subtract two from it, you're still going to get a negative number, and then you take it to the third power. Well, a negative number to the third power is going to be a negative number. So that right over there is going to be negative. So you're going to have a positive divided by a negative. So g prime is going to be negative. So let me write that down. So on this interval, on this interval, I'll write it like this, g prime of x is less than zero. Or if we cared, if we wanted to know when it's decreasing, we would know it's definitely decreasing over that interval. Now let's take, let's take the interval between zero and two. Right over here. So this is the interval from zero to two, the open interval. So what's going to go on with the g prime of x here? Well, once again, x squared, anything greater than a zero, and it says we're not including zero in this interval, well, this is for sure going to be positive. And so let's see, if we have x minus two, where x is greater than zero but less than two. So if x, we could just say, for example, if x was one, one minus two is negative one. We're still going to get negative values in this denominator right over here. So since we're still going to get negative values in this denominator, the denominator is still going to be, take a negative value to the third power. Well, you're going to still get a negative value. So this is going to be negative. So you're still going to have g prime as less than zero. So let me write that down. So you still have g prime of x is less than zero. And then let's take the interval above. Let's take the interval from two to infinity. Two to infinity. Well, the numerator is positive. It's always going to be positive for, for any x not being equal to zero. And this denominator, you're taking values greater than two, subtracting two from it, which is still going to give you a positive value. You take the third power, it's all going to be positive. It is all going to be positive. So this is the interval where g prime of x is greater than zero. So on which intervals is g increasing? Well, that's where g prime of x is greater than zero. So it's going to be from two, from two to infinity. Or we could just write it like this. We could write x is greater than two. Either way, if for either of these, g prime of x is greater than zero, and your function g is going to be increasing.